Hello, everybody, with the NFL draft fresh in everybody's mind. This seemed like the perfect opportunity to review this Kevin Costner classic, Draft Day. Came out one year and one month ago exactly to this recording. I have Nick Rice with me for this episode. He's been on more episodes of the podcast than anybody else, but it's his first time reviewing a movie with me. And this was actually his choice. So, Nick, thanks for being here. Appreciate this, man. Yeah, I get to choose when I want to show up, what movies we're going to break down, what stuff we're going to talk about. You know, I kind of run this place now. You know, a little bit. I might have to change the name of the of the show here soon. But yeah. uh, this has actually been a long time coming. Uh, I've been doing more movie reviews lately. And Nick has never really been a movie buff, but he's been creating the list of movies that he's missed out on that he's been I'm, meaning I'm, to watch. I'm getting and more towards the middle. I used to be. You are. Right. You're we're, we're getting great there. with that. And I was like, hey, you've never done a movie review. What? sports movie do you want to review and in like half a second he responded with draft day and we found that out like late last year sort of like what if we wait until after the draft because this movie came out in 2014 and it'll be the 10 year anniversary of uh, draft day and as i said we're recording this one year and one month to the day of its at least north american release yet another sports classic out here to go with to finish the trilogy of Kevin Costner sports movies and Love of the Game and Field of Dreams. This time, not an athlete, but a GM of an NFL team, the Cleveland Browns, uh, to be exact. So, Nick, before we get into the topics, and we have something fun at the end that we won't be able to do in most movies, but we can for this, so that it'll be a good time. Uh, what makes this your, if not your favorite sports movie? It's very uh, It's funny, this came out on DVD when we were actually living together. I remember buying this movie so we could watch it at home. I think you had already seen it in theater, so had I, but it was worth re-watching. But what puts this at the top for you out of all the sports movies out there? It's right up there. Uh, a hidden gem, because you mentioned Kevin Costa. That's really throwing guys like Chadwick Boseman under the bus, mm-hmm. Jennifer Gardner under the bus, Sam Allen, a former NFL running back Arian Foster, so many other great uh, actors in there. So, you know, Maybe those guys kind of knew the gem that this was, but there's a lot of great acting talent there, and they delivered, and Kevin Costner had maybe his best performance, but certainly up there in this film. It was really incredible. It's really unique to have a movie about sports that is about the front office. Really, the only other one I can think of is Moneyball, and then, of course, you can have a little bit of that in Major League. You see more of the front office. You have the evil owner that wants to destroy the team, but like this movie... There's not a snap of football in it with the exception of like some film they're watching, right? The entire thing, really the whole thing takes place in like a 12 to 14 hour period, depending on which time zone you're in. Uh, so the the first the, uh, theme we had here was what is the overall theme of the movie? And to me, it's beating the clock because since the beginning of the movie, you are just up against it. You are trying to make a decision about things. This movie is as charming as it is unrealistic because for people that watch football a lot, those are the people that don't really like this movie. I think we're a rare breed that know and like football enough that we ignore, maybe not ignore, but we accept what it doesn't do correctly and we appreciate what it does do uh, to entertain us. So it does live in this weird world where the team, there's fictional players, but they also reference players that are real. So you kind of have to, like when this movie came out, Seattle had just won the Super Bowl. There's no reason that they would have the number one pick. I don't yeah. think Russell Wilson exists because they're trying to draft Bo Callahan. So you kind of have to not let yourself over those things. But it's hard when they later bring up players that did exist. But then there's a, also you fight that fictional what's real, what timeline. This movie almost takes place in an alternate reality because of that. You can't look at what teams are really doing at the time. You kind of have to forget all that. Yeah, you know, this actually reminds me a little of Remember the Titans, where you're kind of looking at a high school small town that hates the team, hates the coach, and then like three weeks later loves everybody. It's like, yeah. I don't I don't think the timeline is quite that quick. Mm-hmm. And then the same thing with all this, where it just felt like the uh, pressure of trying to perform on draft day is immense, but it felt like Sonny Kevin Costner. It, it kind of got to him a little too much. It felt like yeah. the guy was, had never been in a war room before, had never yeah. done this before. So um, it was the type of movie, like a Disney movie, where half of it made sense, half of it is just for the entertainment. I will give him a little lifeboat on this. I think the point is, like, you find out very early that his dad had recently passed away. So I think that ties into, like, sure. he's not on his A game when he at the one day he needs to be on his A game. 
Uh, but what did you have for the overall theme of the movie? Uh, the pressure of people getting fired. So that kind of goes into how Sonny was just on edge the whole yeah. day. You know, it, it there is a lot of pressure, but I'm sure most teams aren't so knee jerk and impulsive about, oh, let me go ahead and trade all these picks without any backup plan, without letting anybody know. Uh, but where it does feel kind of real is that if the if there were a team that was going to do that, it would be, no offense to all of the uh, fans in Ohio, but the Cleveland Browns would be the team that goes, oh, that sounds good. Let's go ahead and change our whole year plan in the blink of an eye. Yeah, I mean, it, you also have to look at it in the sense that, like, unless the trade is ridiculous like that, it's not going to be entertaining. Like, yeah. You can't make a movie about, hey, I'll give you my first and a third to move up five steps. That's not a movie. You know, this – that's what makes it a movie, and we got to think when this came out, when this was being filmed, the RG3 trade was still kind of fresh in everybody's mind. So I think that was really what they modeled a lot of this after. Uh, they didn't go full Mike Ditko with the you know Reggie Bush trade where they give you know all their picks for an entire draft. So I think it was more based on something like that. Uh, but I agree, uh, dealing with the pressure, beating the clock, like the whole movie, you're just up against it from the moment you know they wake up or whatever. And you mentioned some of the other people that were in this movie and. When you think the late Ch great Chadwick Boseman, you think Black Panther. When you think of him in sports movies, I think most people would go to uh, 42, which has been reviewed on this podcast. Check that out. Um, this is kind of a hit. You mentioned this whole movie is a hidden gem, and I agree. But I think it's the hidden gem for Chadwick Boseman's career, too, because playing uh, Vontae Mack, the linebacker out of Ohio State, um, you almost don't care that he looks way too small to be a linebacker in this movie. Um, he shows a bit of, like, personality that I don't think he gets to in uh, some of his other, you know, if you're, if you're a big fan of his, there might be deep cuts where he gets to show this personality. But I think for like a mainstream movie, like you don't get to see him as loose and happy considering us how stressed out he is uh, about this movie. So uh, we'll go right into favorite character, least favorite character. Um, I, I actually am going to go Avante Mack because you just see this side of Chadwick Boseman that, I don't think you see in a lot of his other, you know, high end movies and with him no longer being with us every time you watch it, you're like, man, what a talented guy and what he gave to the world and everything. And um, I, I love the little things like every time Sonny calls him, he answers the phone, Sonny Weaver Jr. Like he, he's <laughs> saying his own name back to him and and stuff like that. But uh, he's definitely uh, my favorite. And there's a lot of them like the Arian Foster cameo, I think, is just totally random. I don't even think I caught that the first time I watched the movie. Like I knew the guy looked. And he's, he's not exactly someone I've seen talk a lot. Um, so he, he makes, you know, and there is, is definitely a, a nice plug. P. Diddy is randomly in this movie, right? Which doesn't age great with what's going on these days. But he's Bo Callahan's agent and stuff. But uh, for, favorite character, I definitely, out of, a, out of a roster of great characters, I do think Vontae Mack um, is above all others in this. Yeah, I know we're not supposed to, you know, agree. We're supposed to have, like, different characters. But no, nah, Vontae Mack was my favorite, for right. sure. But it was kind of cool, you know, to have Arian Foster and then the vibe of, like, if if there was a guy that was going to kind of act a little like Jim Brown to be Terry Crews, yeah. you know, I thought that was interesting. So mm -hmm. that felt fun. Vontae Mack loved everything about him, but his phone case. Where, yeah, where, the, the yeah, knuckles. The brass knuckles. Yeah. Yeah, it's knuckles, man. I don't know if we've seen that before or if we've seen that since. You know, but other than that, this this movie does age well. But I don't think people are, are using that. So no, but just his his personality was terrific. You know, when he says, "Hey, look back on the film, man, about the four sacks." You know, just like yeah. the little moments where, it, like, he was of all the realistic acting out there. I felt Chadwick Boseman just nailed his character to a T. Right. I mean, I've never made a movie. I've you know filmed TV things and stuff, but I've never been the one that creatively drive a movie. But if you bring me a movie where it said 70% of this movie is people making phone calls, <laughs> I don't know how you make that entertaining, but they pulled it off, right? Um, so to, to be that entertaining, to be a, a saying like in wrestling, if a guy's really good with a promo, they'd say, oh, they'd cheer him if he was reading the phone book. This movie is literally people just call, talking on the phone, reading the phone book uh, back and forth, and he still makes it uh, very entertaining. But uh, to, to have us not agree, I think it's, it's hard to, you know, other than Coster, I think to be the main character of this movie. Granted, you don't see him; you see him as much as the other draft prospects or whatever. But um, the you know the the poster is is just Costner. But like I could he I could have seen him in the background. I, I think that's something uh, they definitely could have done. 
Um, I'll let you go with least favorite character first because mine might. It's going to sound a little harsh, actually, um, but I'll let you go first just in case. I'm afraid we're actually going to have the same guy again. Uh oh. Okay. Well, mine's not a guy, so that's helpful. Okay. All, All right. right. Bo yeah. Callahan. Um, Bo Callahan. Okay. Yeah. And, and, you know, you can't. This is like a threading a needle because, you know, there's no one to hate in this movie. But Bo yeah. Callahan did come off a little, little arrogant, a little hard to figure out. Um, mm. You know what I mean? Again, thread and needles. We're not exactly talking about like you know the 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 most hated person in acting, but yeah, yeah. Just in general, I just felt like it was a little flimsy, and uh, you know, Bo Callahan. Yeah, I I, I think mean, that's by design. I think he's meant to be a little distant, a little cold, a little hard to figure out. Because if that guy was likable, and then he plummeted in the draft, like you'd feel bad for him. They you meant you said the phrase uh, thread the needle. They did just enough that when he was plummeting, you don't like feel bad. You're not like happy. You're like, oh, this guy's career is ruined. But you're like, okay, like you're, I think what's happened to you prior is catching up to you. Uh, right. So I think he's an example of in a movie that doesn't have a villain, unless you count like the Seahawks GM. Like he plays a good, <laughs> a good role of that. Uh, this one's gonna be weird. journey with me, and it's she's in like two scenes. So really, she's fine in one, and she really pisses me off in the other one. Uh, and it is Sonny Weaver Jr.'s uh, mother who decides that the day of the draft, let's go spread your dad's ashes on the practice field because you got nothing going on. So maybe it's because I recently lost a family member. And when everyone comes together, there's family members you like, there's family members you don't like. Not everybody knows how to handle death correctly or processes it the same, but she's clearly not doing it the proper way. I think if the mo- yeah. if I remember correctly, he's passed away like a week ago. So it's only been seven days. But why would you pick draft day? Forget that the draft is three days. Mom, maybe we do that on day three. All right. Well, yeah. Why do we got to do it two hours, five hours before, uh, you know, a franchise? Man- and she, the dad worked in, the- it's not like she doesn't get football. She's been a football wife her entire life. So that one scene, when you're only in two scenes, and you totally, you know, crap to bed in one of them, you're going to be my least favorite character in this movie. Because I could just imagine trying to have the most stressful work day of your life, and she just strolls in. She does that. <laughs> she's rude to the salary cap chick, right? Get me some yeah. coffee. That's not what she does, Mom. So, again, she's like 0 for 2 in, in the one scene, and then the other one she eventually comes back around. But for, for the length of the movie, I actually – I got in a movie that doesn't have a lot of bad characters, like you were saying, I kind of got to go with her. I forget her name, but – Sonny Weaver Jr.'s mom, I think, gets gets that for me. Uh, uh, shoot, Beth or something like that. Uh, yeah. But uh, oh, Barbara, Barbara. Okay. So, yeah. Um, you know, actually, I think this was well executed and well directed because that, I mean, I, I in the moment knew that it was a douche move, but right. it, uh, her character weakened me so much in the beginning when she said, "You're not on Twitter." Uh, we were talking about <laughs> how do you know about the trade? It was that that was like, oh, I okay. like that character. Yeah, and it totally turned me off to the other part that was obviously ridiculous. It's like, mm-hmm. and literally, she shows up not on draft day, on draft hour. It's like, yeah, come on, right. dude! Like, I'm in the middle of a trade here. So, I mean, yeah, it's it's one thing brutal. if Sonny's getting to work and he's walking in his office at eight in the morning and she's there with the with the urn, right? Because yeah. all right, we can we can knock this out in 45 minutes. And, and uh, you know, get back to work. But no, she waits till like the middle of the day. Uh, yep. So that is one in a movie full of ridiculous things. To me, that is one of the uh, most ridiculous things. Mm-hmm. Um, so now let's uh, just move a side on. note before you move on. Yeah, I yeah. can't help but say and I love Sam Allen, but, you know, the, the coach of Wisconsin, you know, who, who oh, understands yeah. that Bo Callahan has baggage and doesn't tell any of the owners. I can only imagine, you know, being an owner putting my job on the line to draft somebody because I trusted that this coach is going to tell me the truth about this player. So right. I, I can only imagine being in those shoes and realizing, Oh, the coach just lied to me. This Bo Callahan really is a mess, but you said he's fine. Yeah. So, I can only imagine how much that happens in real life. Cause there's gotta be coaches that have done it long enough that can say what they need to say without burying the kid. Mm-hmm. You know, you can say like hard worker, glad he was glad he was in my, if you draft him, you get a hardworking kid and you're going to need to work on these areas with him. That's a way you go about it, I guess. Yeah. But to get – and I think Sonny got his answer without getting his answer because the fact that he got so defensive so quick, I think mm-hmm. he, he, he got his answer without getting it, in my opinion. Yeah, exactly. So character. Now, most impactful side characters, to me, there's only one answer, but I'm, I'm interested in, in yours here. 
Uh, for me, it's Allie, otherwise known as Jennifer Gardner, because okay. she was there for every problem. My favorite line was when, uh, I believe it was the coach that just burnt the playbook and, and mm-hmm. nearly set the whole room on fire. And yeah. she puts it out and then is like, okay, can I get you guys anything? And it, Or like, can I get you a coffee? And the coach yeah. is like, yeah, I'll take like green tea or whatever. And then she's like, I'm not giving you a damn coffee. But, yeah. <laughs> I love that. And she just yeah. walked away. So you got to have one hard nose. If you're going to have a, a, a woman dealing with these attitudes and these coaches, you got to have a little hard nosed woman in there if you're going to have one. And I think she played that role perfectly. She, she does play an amazing role in this movie. Normally I would disqualify her from a side character when you're the main love interest, the main character, but there's so many other people in this movie that she does eventually uh, go into the background. So like that's a close one, but I, I, I would agree with you uh, with that. Um, because in these movies, they have to thread the needle. Use the phrase again. When when the the woman works among men in sports, you got to prove that she belongs there without just like pushing it out there. So she explains like, I'm from, I grew up loving this team. I went to, I forget, crazy school, became a capologist. Like that was my in to a male dominated world. I thought she laid it out. It only takes like 10 seconds that she lays it out. And you're like, okay, this woman is here because, in here and all this stuff and perfect it went great so if there wasn't so many people popping in and out of this movie i'd feel like she was in too much of it to be a side character but she does disappear for like 20 minute chunks at a time and then he pulls her in another closet so you know that that's one of my favorite parts where he's pulling her into the closet he's like no not in there again you know that that whole deal (laughs) yep yep but uh many times that they are in that closet the knock on the door comes from my favorite side and that is rick the intern and Sonny even says it. You've been put through the ringer today. And, like, we've both been there. We've both worked uh, aspects. But when you're just starting out, you kind of want to you want to be helpful, but you want to stay out of the way. And that's all this yep. trying to do on this day. Sonny doesn't even know him, when, even though they've met before, apparently. Um, he doesn't even know, really know the guy. And he, he gets in, and uh, everything happens to him. His his poor laptop gets smashed, right? And mm-hmm. that's really weirdly. That's the moment that Sonny has to self reflect and be like, "I just flew off the handle over maybe the one guy in this room that doesn't deserve it right now." Um, and you know that he he admits he's like, "You've been a, you've been a warrior today. We're gonna get you." And it's like the best old guy phrase. We're gonna get you a new computer, one with all the bells and whistles, and uh, <laughs> whatever whatever you Nick whatever gets. that might mean. But yeah, Rick the intern goes through a lot. He's again just trying to be helpful. Every time he has to interrupt them in the closet, it gets more and more awkward and you feel for the guy. And again, I think him, his laptop getting smashed is the thing that calms Sonny down just enough to collect himself. And really, after that moment, he starts to turn the whole movie around. So when I say tactful, if he's not there, if it's some other schmuck whose laptop gets smashed, maybe he doesn't have that moment to calm down because he legit feels bad for the guy. Uh, so that is that is definitely mine. I love this movie that there's not a single line where it felt like there was forced humor. It all felt genuine. Like this definitely would happen. Nobody would try and create one weird one liner out of nowhere. And it was the part where the news came out that they are trading three first rounders to move up and get Bo Callahan. And then the Browns quarterback trashes the, the coach or the uh, Sonny's room or the yeah. uh, office. office. Yeah. And then the, the secretary comes in the guy and he says, uh, yeah. And the, the Browns quarterback wanted me to have sex with my mother. Uh, I said, that he was dead. So <laughs> right. it's kind of hard. And it was the whole vibe of like having your hand on your wrist of like the guy executed it. Terrific. Mm-hmm. You know, that he just said everything that I felt a total guy trying to get out of the way would say. The only other part like that where they attempted a one-liner and it, and it landed was when the Seahawks moved the picks and the fans to start rioting outside the front office. And the guy has the doll that's supposed to look like the GM. It looks like he's hanging him, which is a bit like over the time. I know that's happened yeah. in crazy sports moments in, in way back in the past. But he taps the other guy on the shoulder and says, like, hey, Bill, does that look like me? Like he's trying to, you know, calm the situation, even though he's clearly terrified. But it's also yeah. like twelve people. Like they're not getting in that building. You know, right, it, right. they needed more people for that scene for it to be impactful, uh, in mm-hmm. my opinion. Speaking of, it, speaking of scenes, uh, favorite and least favorite. Um, I'm gonna go reverse order here. Let's go least favorite scene, then favorite scene. So for me, my least favorite scene is when the owner takes Sonny uh out, you know, prior to getting to the office and he keeps saying like you got to make a splash. This is what I need from you today. But he does it, and he he took him to a park. 
they're standing in front of a water park as he's saying this and you get the water splash ride coming down and i'm like that's that's a little too on the nose for me that was very cringy and like if the owner was this quirky semi-likable guy it would work but he's not he's a stoic like he must have thought it was hilarious but Sonny's like i got enough going on that i'm not I'm not landing with this joke, you know, right now. So that that's the, that's the least fair. It's the only one where you mentioned they didn't go for humor. And I don't feel like the movie did. It felt like the character did and it didn't land. But I'm like, you could have had this conversation in a car and made it serious. But you tried to make it goofy a little bit. And you you drove, who knows how far out of your way you drove to a water park. I don't think there's a lot of water parks in Cleveland. So, you know, that's, <laughs> that's another that's one. Mine. And it was sunny the whole time, too. It was like, yeah. oh, okay. Um, I... Kind of disagree. I see where you're coming from in terms of the, um, you know, the water water park is kind of weird, kind of quirky. But I believe that scene was totally necessary. It's mm. one thing to have all these coaches go, oh, my gosh, like you're trading these picks. That's my job. This is my job. You know, the Browns quarterback gets pissed. That's one thing. I totally believe an owner would bring a coach or, you know, bring his, uh, you know, yeah. general manager aside saying you got to make us. I totally yeah. believe that happens. Right. And most, especially, you know, no offense, but yeah, locker rooms where or uh, teams where it's like, we haven't won in a while. I'm ready for a change. I need a splash. I want to sell tickets. Totally believe that. Right. Um, I, I'm okay with the conversation. I just think it was a little cheesy that he brought him to a water yeah, park to have the conversation. Weird. Like I said, if you have it in the back of the limo, I think it lands better. Yeah. Fair, fair. Um, similar vibe. Uh, to me, it was the, uh, there's not really a lot of scenes that I don't like to be caught on us. Yeah. I really right. had to comb through to find a bad one, honestly. So, yeah, I guess just when the owner barges into the room, like right before they make the change, you know, you shove yeah. a bitch and then just yeah. everybody, you know, he's trying to shove everybody away. He said, give me uh, five minutes. You can fire me, yeah. you know? And he's like, well, if I want to fire you, I'm going to do it before the pick and I'll pick Bo Callahan. You know, that could have been, they had to physically restrain the guy, but yeah, that felt a little, Unrealistic. Yeah, especially the how old he is. It's like, you know, he didn't have a heart attack afterwards, which I felt was yeah. kind of, you know, unrealistic. Um, and then also, um, shoot, it is leaving me right now. But there's another mini scene that I'm not a huge fan. Oh, when, when you know, the guy goes up to Rick and just starts berating him nonstop. I'm like, really? Mm. He's a grown man yelling at a kid for yeah. takes. It's like, I, I believe the first half of it, but it became over the top uh, right. where I felt it was too much. So I think and that. I think that sort of thing happens when like the guy that's been there forever feels like he lost control of whatever situation. So he finds the guy that he like has control over and just reprimands him for no yeah. reason. And of course, you know, Ali comes in, the sour cap guru, and it's like, what the you know, what the fuck is your problem? Like you have no right <laughs> yeah. to yell at him like that. I will get you your tapes back off, basically. So yeah, that yeah. was that was tough to watch. And maybe because we've probably both been there in that scenario, not for an NFL draft, but you know what I'm talking about. So mm-hmm. I agree. Not, not the best one. Um, my favorite involved. Bo- so it's like a two parter. It's like, a co- it's a comedic scene that opens at the beginning of the movie. And it comes back around um, basically in the last scene of the movie. So book, it basically bookends the movie, but they're the ones involving pancakes when they're trying to make the trade in the beginning. And he offers him like a crazy uh, deal. And he, I knew you, know, you would say this. Yeah. I knew you because he's like, "Oh, I'm just here enjoying Total my pancakes." Filthy. He's Total like, I'm, "I'm just enjoying my pancakes, thinking about moving number one." And he says, "Enjoy your pancakes, Tom," and hangs up, which is basically saying, "Go oh. after." So yeah. when he so when he calls him back later, he's like, "You still want to move number one?" He's like, "I was," and then he told me to go uh, eat my pancakes. And yeah. again, he knew that in between. And then when he gets all the picks back. He says maybe the greatest insult in a sports movie when he calls him a pancake eating motherfucker. So that <laughs> so really it's a comedy comes in threes. It's a three part series that when you put them all together, it just makes a movie that's not meant to be funny. It is like, wow, they, they, they put three comedic scenes together that carry you through the movie. So pancakes in general, huge win in this movie. I and you're right. Like I would say that I would be either guy in that conversation. So, yeah. yes, definitely a Phil scene. I think they actually had two Phil scenes. I thought you were going to reference this one, not the pancake one. And it's when uh, he's trading, when Bo, uh, uh, Sonny is trading with the Seahawks the GM about the three draft picks, and he finally gets him to cave. And then he says, oh, that offer is no longer available. I want your yep. return, too. And it was like that part where I'm like, 
like I think you're you're one of those fans that love a full circle film where it's right. like there's a reference in the beginning and then at the very end there's that extra punchline with that uh, full circle deal. So I love that scene. Uh, realistic, totally not. There's yeah. no way to move up one spot. A team would trade three first in a in a you know, yeah. but that's the way the movie was. And the the whole you mentioned coming back around where he's you know in the in the beginning of that part. Uh, Ooh, I just lost it. The um, oh, we're we're we don't live in a, now. Yeah, we yeah. don't live in the same world we did five minutes yeah. ago, and then Clint gets to use that line too. So yes, that, you could almost they, they happen right after the pancake scenes both times. So really, it's like this: these two minute windows are going to come back around. So uh, hundred percent agree with you. I love um, a movie like that. Um, you know, a lot of the M Night Shyamalan movies are like that, where you can watch it a couple times and be like, "Oh my gosh, that was incredible!" Like you could mm-hmm. tell it wasn't just. Here's the story. It's going to start with the uh, with with draft day and end with the pick. But they actually went into all right. Here's here's how we're going to you know create some uh, whatever the word is foreshadowing to how things are going to end. So right. I haven't been in English class for a while. So yeah, foreshadowing. Yeah, I hear you. So this one is a little more challenging in a movie like this. But we're going to give it a shot anyway. Uh, okay. Pe- piece of memorabilia that you would most want to have from this movie. And this is something off the set, you know, framed, signed by Kevin Costner, whoever, from the movie, right? Um, so I have two. Um, one, okay. to me, it's a, it's a little easy. Um, again, this would need to be signed by Bozeman or, or uh, Costner, but the note that says Vontae Mack, no matter what, and have that framed that up. Is cool. That would be cool. And then the funny one, it would be very hard to display, uh, would be the smashed up laptop, I think, would be very funny. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Oh man, throwing me in a corner here because I did not um, talk a little more about that. I need I need like thirty seconds to think more about memorabilia you know, because this did not feel like a memorabilia movie. No, it no, it, it was definitely a harder one. I feel like you mentioned something earlier that could have been your your pick, and I can't think of what it is. So if something comes to you, we'll come back to it. But it okay. it's not a movie for things like that. Definitely. Oh, you, Chadwick Boseman's. Uh, Brass knuckle phone. Oh case. yeah, yeah. That was it. Knuckle. That's what All you right, should. There right? it is. Yeah. There, so, there was hey, memorabilia. Talk about four, right? We brought that back mm-hmm. in. So I wonder what's uh, more valuable. Yeah, the movie itself or just that that <laughs> phone cover. Right. Whatever that is. All right. So we uh, movie a handful of times, as have I. What what one or two scenes? What is what is this movie most known for? If you had to pick a scene um, about this movie that you think most people most relate to it most relate to uh or like when when you mention the movie draft day to somebody what what scene do you think comes to mind what's the most memorable and i'll I'll give you mine if you need it it's a myriad of scenes that i think uh were well crafted um i love the um the drama throughout the day and where they go the the scene transition where they'll show the practice field or the stadium, and then it'll show home of the chiefs. Yeah. That the was Seahawks. Cool. They should have done that music. more, honestly. Right. Yeah. yeah. I kind of wish there was a few more teams in play. I think they like have when to. they call the Jags, I don't think they do the, they don't give them the, the drone right. treatment. I think it would have been well, cool. Maybe to do there's, that. A, there's a budget. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Point, but, mm-hmm. um, so yeah, mine for that the is going to be, were... oh, go ahead, uh, go ahead. No, no, I was going to say, I, I didn't know if you had one yet. Uh, the scene, uh, I, I don't know about relate. I'm just thinking yeah. the scene where they say, and I want your punt returner too. And mm-hmm. then um, they execute the trade. And then it's Vontae Mack in that tear jerking moment where he's in the center of the huddle saying, let's go. And then they all run yeah. out and mm-hmm. the movie ends like that. I think right. ironically, it's the final scene that didn't have any implication on the sure. movie, but it to me was indicative of the movie. Mm. Um, to me, considering we were like a week and a half, two weeks removed from the NFL draft this season, to me, it's the two scenes, the two things that get quoted from this movie every NFL draft season. And I, I did it this year. The Vontae Mack, no matter what, people will tweet like, I want Caleb Williams, no matter what. Like, that's a line that sticks with people. And then the other one, if if someone falls in the draft or something and people are wondering why, I think it comes out, someone's bound to make the joke like, what's going on? Did his teammates not come to his birthday party or something? So like every draft season, I feel like those are the things. And again, we're a decade removed from this movie coming out. People will still reference that. So to me, those are, those are the two uh, scenes it's most known for. Yeah. 
Total hilarious side note. We're like, they're on draft day, and we didn't bring this up yet, but uh, Jennifer Garner is going to have a baby. Oh, yeah. yeah. They've got the mock draft with Mike Mayock on there. <laughs> it was just hilarious. Like, she is such a football junkie that even on, you know, her conception day, she's having freaking Mike Mayock and the NFL Network on. I thought yeah. that was hilarious. Yeah. That's true. Um, all right, so next we're going. We've poked a few holes in this movie as it's gone on, and it's it's in a respectful way. We we wouldn't be reviewing the movie if we didn't enjoy it. So there's only a oh, few yeah. few little plot hole, a few things worth mentioning. Um, they make a big deal that Sonny, you traded three first round picks. You traded three for no, he didn't. Okay, he traded two and a pick swap. That is yep. much different than giving up three. And it's again, you're basing it off the RG three trade. But if if you had the number one overall pick and I had seven. What I did is we stopped first and then gave you my first rounder the year after and the year after that. So the fact that nobody – and these aren't fans saying it. These are people in an NFL office that don't know the difference between three and two in a pick swap. Oh, it really bothers me. Yeah. Uh, so that's one that I had for that. It's funny this about – it almost gives the Browns a little momentum. People are like, oh, what are the real Browns going to do? And they draft Johnny Manziel like a week yeah. after the movie comes out. So I thought that was kind of funny. And uh, just an interesting one, when this script first came out, uh, the team wasn't the Browns they were going to use. They were actually going to use the Buffalo Bills. Uh, but then they wanted the Seahawks role to be the Jets, and it all fell apart because one person said uh, interdivision rivals would never trade picks like that. So there is a version of this movie where it's uh, the Jets and the Bills, which would have been hard to believe that uh, teams would um, – you know, in interdivisional teams uh, would, would trade like that. So probably the right move. Uh, but do you have any, you know, last minute plot hole things before we have our, our final segment here? Yeah, well, shoot. We just saw Xavier Worthy get, uh, you know, taken by the Chiefs in a trade with the Bills. They're not even division rivals, and people were totally up in arms because yeah. they just so happen to be de facto rivals with the how many years they played in a row. Um I don't know if you're referring to maybe like the plot holes, some of the things, yeah, that you were you were kind of frustrated with. With me, and it's understandable that the mom wants to spread the ashes and that they're having a baby, but it was the sheer amount of times that Sonny was losing his cool that to me felt a little unrealistic. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I understand the first time, maybe the knee-jerk reaction to trade the picks, but then he was, he was about ready to scream at everybody and needed Jennifer yeah. like 10 times to cool him down. It right. felt a lot. So yeah. it, he wins in the end, and it's in a way where it doesn't feel realistic. But in general, it was the unstable nature of him, you know, that felt I, over I the top. I do appreciate that, like, again, like in Major League, like the Indians win the pennant, and it's like that's never uh, – that rarely happens. So, like, I'm glad this movie didn't end with, like, oh, the Browns are going to the Super Bowl. It just ends yeah. on a – they might go have a great season. They'll, they're they right. going to make the playoffs. Like, it didn't kill you uh, at the end there, I think. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so this is something we have not done on any movie review before because there's not sports movies where like every main character is a fictional character. So as we get out of here, we're about 30 minutes in. Uh, all the main characters that are actual players bring up real quick and try to uh, compare them to who we think they're. These are all draft prospects, right? Except for one that we will say what kind of player we would we compare them to once they got in the league. And I did it a little differently than Nick. I gave like a ceiling and a floor player. So I think, all right, this particular person at his best, he might be this guy at his worst. He might be this kind of guy. So do you want to go? We both said Vontae Max, our favorite player. Do you want to do him first? Or do you want to wait till last on him? I'll wait till last. Cause I, okay. you know, that's nice. All right. So let's do, let's do the one guy who's not being drafted. Let's get him out of the way. So Brian drew is the quarterback that the Browns, uh, decide to to hang on to to not get Bo Callahan for, and he's clearly liked in the locker room, liked by the coaches. So because of that, I think Brian Drew I'd compare to peak Joe Flacco. Like if they go on a run, it'd be because it's a, like a year where a year. This guy's always been pretty good, but this is unbelievable. He's MVP. Did Joe Flacco get number. hurt? Uh, you know, a couple times. I'm or sure, like later. I think later in his career he did, oh. and that's I think that's how Lamar got on the field in the first place. And then, that makes sense. Okay. yeah, and then the low end, I think it's again just a really productive dude that people like. So I'm going with Ryan Fitzpatrick. I think I like he's it. somewhere, some combination, or somewhere in the middle of those two guys. Uh, and and the personality makes sense. He does feel like a Joe Flacco, Ryan Fitzpatrick, kind of yeah. like a 
guns flinging, like fun guy to be around who, who wears his emotions on his sleeve. Right. Um, Brian Drew is the interesting one. Um, hmm. I didn't think about of, of Brian Drew. I actually thought there was two guys that I have comps for. Okay. Uh, since you did a good comp of him, uh, Bo Callahan, and we brought him up earlier. And let me explain before everyone puts their arms up sure. in the air. And we don't know if if he'll be productive yet, but it's Caleb Williams. Reminds me of him. Where it's, it's fair. apparently Bo Callahan's got all the tools, but there's just something about his personality that drives people aloof with Bo Callahan. For some reason, nobody showed up to the birthday party, which was a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and with Caleb Williams, and you know, no, it, it's it's a free country man, but he's got the the fingernails, and he's got like the quirky personality where people kind of are are drawn off of him. Yeah, he could uh, definitely rub somebody the wrong way. Exactly. Where yeah. it's just like with Bo Callahan, it's like it's an acquired personality. You really yeah. gotta. There's only a certain percentage of people that would really, you know, and everybody's different. So yeah, he reminded fair. me a lot of Caleb Williams, who also was projected number one overall pick. So right. Uh, so my high for Bo Callahan, funny, and I did not do this just because you're here, but yeah. in the in the clip in college, I felt like he was a type just on the field, not personality on the field, because he was like a tall, strong dude. You see him like get out of the one sack, roll to his right, throw the ball deep downfield. Like right. I could see it being a Herbert, and then the low end, and this is where the personality pulls in a little bit is like a Carson Wentz type, where clearly the talent's there, <laughs> but when things aren't going. He kind of crumbled a little bit. So I could yeah, see that personality if things go good, kind of, he's yeah. Justin Herbert. If things go bad, that personality like becomes it. an issue. Because not that he was like a team cancer or anything, but there was clearly times uh, where, you know, bad when, it, when the Eagles, when the Colts had him and that kind of went overboard. Like, he didn't seem like the best leader. And that seems like when things go bad, potentially Bo isn't uh, the best leader. I, I, you put a lot of time into this, didn't you? <laughs> you could argue I put too much time into this, so I might as well you know, get it all out there. Right. Uh, this one I thought was a little harder because we see very little of him. Uh, Ray Jennings, a Florida back player, Arian Foster, as you mentioned earlier. Um, it's really interesting, and maybe only I would know this, but uh, when they use the clips of the guys in college, like Vontae Mack, you, clearly it's like a movie version of a football play. Same with Bo Callahan. They use like two clips of Ray Jennings at Florida State, and they are both old footage of Greg Jones, the running back of Florida State in like the early 2000s. He actually like crazy. He broke his leg or ankle or something. Really like high end running back. Um, broke his ankle, plummeted in the way. He actually became like a fullback for many years for the Jaguars. And yep. it's only because I watched him play for the Jags that I would recognize his highlights. I and mean, again, it's just two quick plays of him like breaking a tackle and scoring a touchdown. But like the yeah. clips are so like synonymous with, with Greg Jones that I'm like, oh, they didn't bother filming a Florida State <laughs> stunt double for this. It's just yeah. Greg Jones. And I, I think that the laziest thing I could do is – so this one, again, very hard. You only see two clips of the guy. So I will go on the low end. I'm going to go James Cook of the Buffalo Bills. I think he signed somewhere else uh, this year. But, uh, you know, we as of right now, we'll know him as Buffalo Bills running back. You know, maybe not a full-time starter, maybe not a three-down back, but a guy that's productive that will get you yards, score you touchdowns. And then the high, I will go with the prime Raheem Mostert that we just saw with the Dolphins. I think that is uh, someone that, you know, he's had his chances in the past with the 49ers and then early with the Dolphins, but he just broke the Dolphins' touchdown record this year. So I could see Ray Jennings as a Raheem Mostert, you know, now finally getting that opportunity to be the guy. Um, and then he had that little – personality issue in the movie that he got in a fight his team had kind of ignored that because it didn't seem like he really did anything wrong in the movie uh so yeah. i didn't really i didn't really pull that into anything uh so yeah i'm gonna go james cook low raheem mostert high on that one so what do you got for this uh this guy is a guy that played for your team and played for my team if you remember uh, ryan matthews okay uh, fair he, yeah he looks he looks a lot like him and he was very quiet just mm -hmm. like a Ray Jennings was. And yeah. he he gives that vibe where Ray Jennings would probably just have a decent career yeah. uh, being, you know, people talking about him being the number one running back. I think people thought he'd be the next LT and he wound up just being solid. You yeah. know, not great, not bad, just solid. The only, I think, I think he'd, 
the good in Ryan Matthews I, I work with, I, I and as, again, somebody who played for my team and your team, kind of had a problem holding on to the ball throughout his whole career. That doesn't wow. seem to be like a problem for Ray Jennings, but that yeah, could have been something right. that happened later on. So I, I told I a pick there. All right. All right, so the grand finale here is late, Jake, late great Chadwick Boseman, Vontae Mack. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll, do, do you have, I'll let you do this one first. You, you go ahead and hit this one. Yeah, he's one of our favorite players that I, I find a great comp to. Uh, not necessarily the same exact position, yeah. but uh, Luke Keekley gives me a lot of Vontae Mack vibes. That's, you know just, what? Yeah, is it, it doesn't he feel just that. like him? <laughs> That's good, yeah, no, especially in the Wisconsin. They give him – way too big of pads in those Wisconsin right. Ohio he looks like Kevin Hart out there. <laughs> so <laughs> I try to ignore that. Um, but I'm going to go with um, on the high end, I'm going Josh Allen, Buffalo Bills, Josh Allen. I could see just a high motor. You know, maybe his emotions get the best of him here and there. If things aren't going, not necessarily going his Fair way, enough. but you're getting held and it's not being called and, or you get a late hit on what is just a regular sack. Like that seems like the kind of guy that, that stuff would happen to based on like recovering the fumble, giving it to your sister, getting kicked out of the, that sort of thing. Uh, the low end, for, I will go with a guy that w- people were pretty high on when he came out of the draft, had a decent career, had a couple like infamous and memorable moments. I'm going to go with former Jaguar and Steeler miles. Jack, I would be the low end. Like if things don't work out, he's still a solid starting linebacker. I think is what I'd go with. Yeah. That was a fumble by the way. But yeah, it's not and Miles Jack <laughs> wasn't down either. Definitely not. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not to tire any old wounds, but yeah. uh, I think we had some great comparisons. Vontae Mack clearly was the uh, you know fan favorite of the film. Everybody loved him. He hung in there, and he just was so cool and collected when they said, "Yeah, we, we traded our picks. We're not going to get you, and you'll fall to the teens." Then mm-hmm. he gets drafted one overall, and he's just sitting there, stunned, motionless yeah. that he got picked that high. So you know. Super cool. I think he wound up becoming Luke Keekley, to be quite honest with you, in the NFL. No, that's that's a great that one that I did not quite throw together. So I think you did. Can't you believe did it. That one. Um, mm-hmm. So normally don't you miss this, and I'm, I'm all for it. On our way out here, what do you give this movie at, at, for a rating? Eight and a half. Eight and a half. The acting I felt was good. I almost feel weird not giving it a nine, but mm-hmm. it was the – you know, it, it didn't feel overly realistic, like I said, with Sonny. And then also, I wish there was a few more teams in play. You know, that it would I feel agree. a little more realistic. Like, oh, my gosh, I'm getting all these calls now that I'm the number one pick. Getting, like, yeah. one call felt a little unrealistic, too. And, you know, yeah. for football fans like you and me, it bugs us. But for fans of, you know, just regular PG-13 yeah. movies, you know, that are fun sports, where it's like, I don't know sports, but I'll watch it. Yeah, It was kind of more for them. So I think for for if we weren't, we didn't care about sports, I think maybe it'd be higher than eight and a half for me. I agree. So I, I always feel when I do rate movies, I'm a little too forgiving, but your number is actually higher than mine. I was going to go seven and a half. Oh. I agree wow. with, I agree with your, we could have seen more team, even if they don't call Sonny, like I wouldn't mind a, uh, you know, we already saw the chiefs. I wouldn't mind an Atlanta Falcons calling the New York jets about something unrelated, like see how other teams interact with each other. I think it did. Yeah. It is missing that. I can do an eight, but I will sit at a seven point five. I think. Oh we're gonna man, you it. are a tough grader, man. Yeah, I feel like I'm. I feel like I'm pretty lenient on grade. If we do more of these, you'll see my grades for other movies. I are pretty because like I base it off how much I like it, not necessarily if it's a good or great movie. I guess is what I'm doing. Um, but I think it's a. It was a really hard topic to make a movie on, and they they pulled it off. Yes, there's things that could have been different. Um, but overall, I, I think it's really hard to complain about. I think to make a seven and a half, eight movie off this topic, I think is is great. I would love another one, even if Sonny's retired and it's somebody else. Maybe Ali. You love another C movie, I guess. I love another draft day movie. Yeah, I think right. that'd be, I think it'd be dope. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. All right. So any any uh, last thoughts before we get out of here? Just the thought that you give this type of movie a seven and a half. My goodness. I'm afraid to to give you my second favorite sports movie. You might give that a freaking six or you know a what? five. My goodness. You know Jeez. what, Nick? As, as you were speaking, um, we actually don't live in the same world we did when I gave the rating. So I'm going to go with an eight. You talked <laughs> yeah, me into it. I said you could right. do it. You talked me into it. Uh, cool. But that's going to do it for us, guys. I want to thank Nick for doing this again. He's been more than anybody. And we had a lot of fun. You know, we're just not, it's fun reacting to what's really going on world see you guys next time and uh, have a great night and don't forget Vontae Mack no matter what take care